full disclosure, the voice you are listening to now is artificially generated, brought to you by Satisphonic.com. See the link in the description for more details. What infamous movie plot hole has an explanation that you're tired of explaining? The Matrix reloaded the scene where Neo is talking to the architect. The screens behind them are not other ones. It is the predictions the machines are making on Neo's responses. Most of the scenes are incorrect in those predictions, except for when Neo must choose between Trinity and all of humanity. The machines nailed that response on all screens. Honestly, I'm glad I finally have an explanation for this scene, because they're discussing how many times this has happened before while we're looking at it, and the architect says something about having two different ways to calculate that number of times they've gone through it. Since they're talking about this while we see the different Neos, I always thought that's what they were trying to show. Since it was never explained, I'm just now learning about it. I'd figured out everything else after repeated viewings, but never understood that part. There was a whole topic on the front page a while back about the Truman Show, asking about what happens when Truman wants to sleep with his on-screen wife. Is that upsetting to her because she's just an actress? How do they avoid showing it on TV? People offering all kinds of explanations like he was raised not to know what sex is. I thought I was going crazy because not only does the movie directly address this, two guys watching the show complain that the camera always cuts away when Truman and his wife go to bed, but it's an actual plot point in the movie that she's trying to have a baby with him so that they can start Truman show phase two, and his obsession with a the woman they kicked off the show years ago is ruining the director's plan. People have apparently never heard of the concept that people are willing to have sex for money and or fame. She would have been well aware what she was signing on for and agreed to it. She was specifically cast to be his love interest and eventual wife's, so they found an actress who was willing to do all that that entailed. People sometimes wonder how Indiana Jones initially remained skeptical of the mystical events happening in the second film, when he just witnessed a magical arc mass killing a bunch of Nazis in the first film. But that's because the second film is a prequel. Also, the majority of artifacts and myths Indiana Jones interacts with are completely mundane. They have fascinating cultural significance and implications on history, but they are ultimately just mundane. The encounters with the supernatural are clearly rare exceptions he gets caught up in, not his primary field of expertise. Like, even if literally Atlantis was discovered right here and now, today, that doesn't mean the lost continent of Mo or the city of El Dorado, or the city of El Dorado, or the lost colony of Norumbega, or anything else is real. It means Atlantis is apparently real. Exactly. Just because that one artifact was actually magic, doesn't mean every mythical artifact is real. How does Sarah Connell know which button to press to crush the Terminator in Terminator in Terminator 1984? Because she accidentally presses it a few minutes earlier, and it set the crusher off, it what lead the Terminator to find them. Oh, like in The Incredibles, where Elastigirl has the remote and Bob tells her to push that button again. In Memento, people always wonder how a guy with short-term memory loss remembers he has memory loss. But he's conditioned himself to say it, just like Sammy was subjected to conditioning in the flashback. I love that movie. Everything makes sense, but you still have questions once it's over. One of Charles Foster Kane's servants was outside his bedroom when Kane said, Rosebud, the door was wide open. The dialogue later confirms that a butler heard Kane's dying words and reported it to the paper. Was going to post this. I watched the movie long after I'd seen all the BuzzFeed-style articles about biggest plot holes. Yet when I watched it, I was confused, as it explains that people heard it pretty clearly. Friends. How did they pay for that apartment on their salary in New York? The very first episode, Monica mentions that her grandma owned the apartment, and she would never be able to afford it otherwise. And it was rent-controlled, plus I think it was an illegal sublease, and they had to hide that from the super. Yea, it was a whole episode, and why they gave him dance lessons. No, so he would be friendly and stay quiet. It wasn't owned. It was her grandmother's leased apartment in a rent-controlled building. She was, technically, illegally subletting. On watching The Sixth Sense, it may seem completely improbable that Bruce Willis' character didn't realize that he was dead. Yet it's explained right there in the movie. Ghosts see only what they want to see. They show it in the movie. He can't see things that are different since his death, like the table in front of the basement door. 
not a bad one, but the Delorean in Back to the Future, always being brought up in conversations as actually it was a really crappy car-like. Yes, that was the joke. Marty even asks Doc incredulously, you built a time machine out of a Delorean. The car became famous because of beef. Before then, it was a laughingstock, horridly underpowered with a shitty European six, an incredibly fragile transmission, massive QC issues, and John Delorean himself was a tool. Edit. I figure, if you're going to build a time machine out of a car, why not do it with some style? said by the old guy whose house is full of Rube Goldberg machines and who dresses like Dr. Frankenstein. The movie was deliberately poking fun at how unstylish Delorians are. I think it's fallen out of favor as a phrase now, but for decades a really common way to poke fun at anything that looked bizarre or needlessly futuristic was to say something along the lines of that thing looks like a goddamn time machine. Guaranteed people were making fun of Delorians for looking like a goddamn time machine before the movie was made. Can confirm, I was in college when Butter came out. John Delorean's trial had been all over the news a couple of years earlier, and the Delorean had gone from a novelty to a joke. When we saw the movie in the theatre in 1985, we were laughing. I am so late to the party, but legally blonde Ong, a dumb blonde sorority girl, studied for the LSAT for a summer and aces it. Bullshit! No! No! The point is that Ella Woods was never a dumb blonde. She was always brilliant. Literally, the first scene is her interrogating the salesperson and catching them in a lie because she was observant and smart. Rather, Ellie was pigeonholed by the circumstances of her looks and her privileged upbringing to pursue a vapid life. While inspired by the wrong reasons, it results in her breaking the mold she was confined in so that she is able to reach her full potential. Also, her guidance counselor literally says that she has near-perfect grades in her classes. She makes fun of the type of classes because they are focused on fashion, but we have no idea how hard those classes actually are. I have seen people with engineering degrees fail basic marketing classes in a master's degree after constantly arguing with a professor who is extremely renowned in her field and advises some of the world's biggest brands because they thought it was easy and just marketing. In Jurassic World, Claire didn't outrun the T-Rex in heels. Because it wasn't chasing her, the dinosaur was conditioned to equate the flare with feeding time, so it was patiently following her to an anticipated meal. The situation is similar to how zookeepers can have limited interactions with lions and bears. Well, I'll be damned. I like to explain this one by saying, if a Tyrannosaurus is chasing you, you will fucking learn how to run in heels. Top Gun, 1986. Goose's death. A lot of people believe that the filmmakers screwed this scene up, stating that the canopy wouldn't have been over the top of the aircraft, and therefore Goose wouldn't have died. It's just poor writing, and yet another example of Hollywood getting it wrong. They're wrong. The F-14 Tomcats Natops, Natops manual states that this is 100% a scenario that can happen. In fact, it got put into the Natops manual because it did happen. If the F-14 entered into a flat spin and ejection became necessary, the procedure was to manually eject the cockpit canopy and wait several rotations for it to clear or get far enough away to not become an issue. Then you eject. Others have then stated why was it Maverick who lived and Goose didn't? Well, because Goose ejected first. Why? Because he was the Rio. The backseater always ejects first. Why? They have literal rockets shoved in the back part of their seat, punching their anus with the acceleration of holy sweet matcha Jesus. If Maverick ejects first, Goose gets his goose cooked. Well done, and in a manner that would make the French cry and riot. If Goose ejects, the electronics get fried and Maverick's seat protects his ass from getting to whole new levels of hot and crispy. What is inaccurate, though, is the fact he was in a flat spin that somehow decided to engage in diplomatic relations with physics and was drifting out to sea. You get in a flat spin, the only direction you're going is down to your grave, not a little to the left, not a slide to the right, not somewhere over there. Down. Unless there were some hurricane-level winds, it ain't happening, and even then, I'm not sure. I'm not enough of an armchair expert to figure that shit out. If someone actually does know, feel free to comment about it. Fun fact, Goose is actually based off of a real person, Lieutenant David J. Goose Lorcher, who died due to ejection accident in an F-14 after colliding with another F-14 off the coast of Puerto Rico. Toy Story. 
Buzz stops moving in front of humans, but doesn't think he's a toy. His delusion is the whole point. It's what drives Woody crazy. He tries explaining it to him. You are a toy. Buzz has training from Space Academy, and the brown bear play dead procedure is taught if you're found by a huge alien creature and unable to run. I irk in the first scene where he interacts with the other toys. He asks what the rules are just before Andy and his friends come in, and all the rest of the toys stop moving. Thus, logically, he'd assume that not moving when humans are around is some kind of law, or a safety precaution. If you were dropped on an unknown planet and all the native species stopped moving when some Goliath wandered by, you might think it wise for you to stand still too. The first rule of Fight Club, and their growing number of members, is because it is meant to teach the members to break rules. And more than that, it's to teach them to secretly break rules. They aren't intending to start a war like redcoats lining up in formation. It's supposed to be on the down low. I see a lot of new faces here, which means a lot of you have been breaking the first two rules. Camera pans to everyone smirking. It's pretty obvious that this is the most commonly broken rule, and their fearless leader doesn't give a shit about it being broken. He breaks many of his own rules, including when he nearly beats Jared Leto to death. A bigger plot hole was that someone wanted to fight Brad Pitt Edward Norton after he was beating himself up in a parking lot. That's not a guy you even look at, let alone ask for a fair one. Yea, who would look at a guy beating himself up alone in a parking lot at night and think, that's a cool and not totally insane dude. Let's be part of his yet to be created. Cult, still my favorite movie of all time, though. They weren't looking for a fight, they were just looking to beat someone up. And who better than the guy who clearly wants to take a few punches? There's enough unreliable narration in that story to suggest Jack Tyler picked that fight. Edit. I know his name isn't ever stated in the film to be Jack. I think everyone knows this. However, he's been referred to colloquially as Jack in online discussion of the film since its release. It's a familiar term, originating from the I Am Jacks. Dialogue a voiceovers in the film and him being named Jack in the script. If you refer to him as Jack, everyone knows who you are talking about, especially considering he has his followers pick fights. I didn't see this as a plot hole per se, but I never thought of that explanation. Well done! Not exactly a plot hole, but I hate when people misinterpret the scene in The Incredibles where Violet saves Dash from being shot as her intending to take the bullets for him. Yes, Dashes, how are you doing that? And she responds, I don't know, but the that he means is suspending herself in midair inside a spherical force field, which she's never done before. She already knew how to make dome-shaped fields big enough to cover Dash. We saw her do that when they were fighting at dinner earlier in the movie. She jumped in front of Dash, because that was the only way she could get close enough to him in time to protect him, since she had not yet learned how to make force fields far away from herself, like we see her do when fighting the Underminer in the sequel. It was also about maintaining them. All throughout the earlier movie, she can only create them for seconds, hence her being unable to protect the plane and the force field hitting Dash briefly. But when her little brother is in danger, she doesn't think, she just does leading her to being able to produce and maintain it for the first time ever, protecting both her and Dash, despite being shot at the <laughs> Katniss, who nearly died in the Hunger Games twice, yet still had sympathy for the children of the capital, wasn't acting out of character when she agreed to Coin's idea of one last symbolic Hunger Games with the capital children. When Coin suggested the symbolic Hunger Games, that was the moment Katniss made up her mind to assassinate hers but I think she had been considering it long before then. She only agreed so Coyne wouldn't suspect anything. Plus, it's very clearly stated that she, Hamish, and Peter had all agreed to just keep their heads down and not get noticed by anyone. Like the book just says that when Hamish votes with Katniss, he says, I'm with the Mockingjay, not I'm with Katniss, a super subtle way of saying he understood she had something up her sleeve by voting that way despite knowing her well enough to know she wouldn't personally want more game. She's all that. So, he makes a bet that he can make a pretty girl into the hot girl when all it takes is taking off her glasses and fixing her hair and changing her hair and changing her out of overalls and into a red dress. No. The bet was that he could make Lainey Boggs into a prom queen over the more popular but less likable Taylor Vaughn. Zack explicitly points out that she's scary and inaccessible, an antisocial artsy chick who shuts herself off from people and hides in her basement to paint. 
It isn't until he does chores for her to free up her time enough to get her to leave the house and go to the beach and join a party that she becomes well known enough to be a serious contender for prom queen. Also, Lainey still loses. As it turns out, fixing up her appearance doesn't automatically help her win a popularity contest. But she's got paint on her overalls. No, not Jenny Briggs. She's got glasses and a ponytail. You haven't spoken to me in like four years, Jake. Actually, it's more like six, because the time you're referring to, when we were standing in line at that movie theater, I was actually saying hey to the person right behind you. That movie is legit fantastic. Jake. Ooh, cool. What about the Fratelli sisters? Indicates awkward Siamese twins conjoined at the head Austin. So they're slightly disfigured and connected at the head. But combined, those two make up one pretty decent chick. Is there some kind of Mandela effect going on with the Titanic movie? Why doesn't Rose let Jack get on? They can both fit. Jack does try to get on. It starts to sink with both of their weight on it. It's a case of people thinking if they spent enough time solving the problem, they could figure it out. Hell, Mythbusters showed that by rigging up the life preservers, they could both fit on. It was dark, and the water was ice cold. Every minute in the water was risking death. They tried it once. It failed. Jack made a call. That was an entirely reasonable decision given the circumstances. It's not about fitting on. It's about buoyancy. Yes, they could both fit on, which would have doomed them both because the door did not have enough buoyancy. Mythbusters showed that if they had put the life vests under the door, there would have been enough buoyancy to keep them afloat. But that would have required both of them to take off his life vests and position them underneath such that the added buoyancy would balance the added weight in the time they had before Jack froze to death. Failure meant they both died. Jack tried to get on, failed, and made a judgment call. People just don't respect how cold the North Atlantic is. If you weren't 100% on that raft, you would absolutely die from the cold. The fact that they could keep swimming in there without going into cold shock or hypothermia was already pretty unrealistic to me. They had been in the water for a while before. Billy Connolly does a good routine about the North Sea. Every oil rig worker got a presentation warning them that their life expectancy, if they fell in the water, would be roughly 45 seconds. Back on Aberdeen Beach, Billy's mum was shouting, Just get in the water, ya big Jesse. Sudden immersion in cold water, specifically cold water, actually has some pretty shitty cardiac and respiratory effects. It can literally cause a heart attack. It will make you gasp and start breathing rapidly. Mm, not good for not drowning. It's just bad. But it can be conditioned for. After the initial cold shock, you have to worry about it effectively paralyzing you as your body shuts down the use of peripheral muscles to try to preserve the core. Then you drown. You only die of hypothermia when you're wearing flotation. Without it, you won't live long enough for hypothermia to kill you. Encanto Bruno in the walls and Dolores knowing. Not only does she state during the song she can hear him, and at the end of the movie says she knew. This whole family broke into song about we don't talk about Bruno at the mention of the man, so she was basically told probably the same when she tried to tell the family. For the people who spend all the Star Wars movies saying, why don't they just JD mind trick everyone into doing this or that, Obi-Wan is very clear the first time he uses it that it works on the weak-minded. I think the way stormtroopers function throughout the first three films shows they aren't the sharpest tools in the shed and are probably bread train selected to do whatever without question and just be cannon fodder. If I thought you could be an officer on the Death Star, you wouldn't be working at a checkpoint on Tatooine. That guy is co-probably. The flaw in the Death Star's construction. We didn't need Rogue One to explain. It was a deliberate sabotage. So an exhaust port has a flaw. It is not unreasonable to believe that the flaw was necessitated for efficiency. Knowing that the flaw was inevitable, the trench leading up to the port was protected with gun towers. Tarkin, along with other officers, fully believed that the Death Star was superior in its construction that small fighters would pose no threat to them. During the rebel assault, an officer pointed out to Tarkin that the rebel attack is exploiting this weakness and offers to prepare a transport for him, to which Tarkin responds, evacuate in our moment of triumph. I think you overestimate their chances. To them, the weakness is negligible, that there is no chance a rebel fighter would be able to drop torpedoes into the port. And they were right. The first fighter to make an attempt failed. 
Luke was only able to succeed because he used the force instead of the computer, something no one anticipated because they all believed that the JD were extinct. Honestly, I stand by an old Memo Joker defense in the fandom. They vented all the exhaust from a moon-sized space station through a fucking womp. Rat! This isn't a flaw. This is a miracle of engineering. And it's so well protected that it took the savior of the universe to hit it. There were maybe a handful of living beings that could have done what Luke did, one being Vader, who certainly wasn't gonna do it. It wasn't a security flaw. The magical space wizard was just up. Also, for the missile to travel the length of the exhaust port without smacking into a wall and prematurely detonating before it reached the core was one in a million. Like, did you see that 90 degree turn it, did you see that 90 degree turn it did right into the port? Luke didn't just use the force to guide it in, he used the force to guide it in and all the way to the core. Tarkin was completely right to think it was impossible, because without magic, it was about magic, it was. It all came down to arrogance. Vada was also right when he said the power to destroy a planet is insignificant next to the power of the force. Do not be so proud of this technological terror you have constructed. Vader had the coolest fucking dialogue in that movie. Every single time I re-watch that scene with the bounty hunters in Tespe when he says there will be a substantial reward for the one who finds the Millennium Falcon, I just smile at how ridiculously perfect James Earl Jones' voice was for that role deep and commanding at its peak. That scene set up Boba Fett so well with the line, no disintegrations. The torpedoes were actually programmed to do the turn and dive right in, but you would need perfect timing and placement to succeed. Luke used the force merely to fire the torpedo at the right moment and the right distance. He didn't force, push it down the shaft. His abilities were not that advanced yet. I think it was Hishi that did a short with the engineer ranting about it, this station had thousands of lasers, thousands of fighters, Star Destroyer escort with their own lasers and fighters. What the fuck were the odds that a supposedly extinct space wizard would take a one-man fire up against all of that and send a torpedo into a tiny hole while doing five x speed? Off sound? Off sound? I've said this for a while now. I'll defend the movie home alone with my life Kevin got left behind because his family was mad at him and obviously didn't like him that much. He was in his room, and there was so much chaos. Also other factors, such as we see his passport ticket being accidentally thrown away, and a neighbor kid snooping through the van accidentally gets counted. Why didn't Kevin call the police? The phone lines were down. We also see Kevin's mum talking to the police, but they don't care or take her seriously. Also, it is likely that Kevin didn't trust the police, because the burglar disguised himself as a cop. Kevin recognized his golden tooth. The thing people bring up that has some validity is how Kevin pulled off the traps and how he had some of the stuff he used. For this, it's just expected to suspend your disbelief, because it's a comedy for kids. But also some things are plausible. I can fully believe that young boys in the 90s had a Michael Jordan cardboard cutout. Why didn't Kevin call the police? The phone lines were down. We also see Kevin's mum talking to the police, but they don't care or take her seriously. Also, it is likely that Kevin didn't trust the police because the burglar disguised himself as a cop. Kevin recognized his golden tooth. He also stole the toothbrush in the store when the old man is there. A cop chases him, so he thinks he'll be arrested if he calls the cops. Everyone always asks why there was a desert in Washington, D.C. in Transformers 2. It has been clearly explained in a ton of discussions of that movie that it was just a really bad movie. Mayo never realized it was Washington. Yep, they were in the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum, and when they go outside, there is an airplane graveyard in a desert. What do you mean? There is a whole desert-themed aircraft boneyard in the back of the Smithsonian. This was clearly established in Night of the Museum, Battle of the Smithsonian. I don't know if you'd call it a plot hole, but I have had to explain it to people before. Jenny didn't think she was in love with Forrest because she thought she was taking advantage of him in the same way her father molested her. He was mentally challenged. She knew this. She had seen it her entire life. She didn't think he was emotionally capable of knowing what real love is. She didn't want to turn into her father, not with the one person who actually treated her like a human being. She also blamed herself for leading him on because she thought she was abusing him, the way her father did with her, which drove her into a self-destructive life path. 
from Independence Day, how could a virus programmed on Earth computers destroy the computer system of an alien civilization? In a deleted scene, it's revealed that technology from the spaceship at Area 51 was harvested and used as the basis for most of Earth's post-Twitter computer technology. Once you know that, the whole thing becomes a lot more believable. I prefer to think that the alien computers couldn't decipher the Makos, so it exploded itself. I always thought of it as a call back to War of the Worlds, the original alien invasion story. At the end of the book, the aliens are defeated by any man-made weapon but by bacteria and germs. They were so advanced, they forgot about an immune system and simply got sick from Earth diseases. A modern alien invasion movie using a different kind of virus to defeat the aliens is a nice callback. Home Alone. It's very clearly explained how they paid for the trip to Paris and that Kevin's dad didn't foot the bill. I never realized there was a plot hole with paying for the trip. What exactly is the supposed plot hole? It's not. It's a dumb theory that Kevin's dad is a mob boss because it's the only way he can afford anything. What? They live in a big house in a really upscale Chicago suburb and Kevin's mom has on more Burberry than Moira from Schitt's Creek. Not to mention, the resemblance is uncanny. I thought the brother in Paris is the one that paid for the trip. Or is this what you meant? Sorry if it's a stupid question. It's been a while since I've watched it. Also, his brother must have been loaded owning that big-ass house in Manhattan in the second movie. Why would his dad paying for the trip be a plot hole? If anything, if he was poor, it'd be a plot hole on why the wet bandits would want to rob the place. It's not really a plot hole, but people have decided since the movie doesn't actually say what his dad does to afford a house like that, that he's either in the mob for some reason or that it's a plot hole. It's almost like the dad isn't the main character, so there's no reason to even bother adding in a tossed-off line about him being some high-paid executive in a Chicago-area business. He could also just come from money. His brother in France clearly has money. Frank is a cheapskate obsessed with money. So it's entirely possible the McAllisters could also just have money from inheritance. Jurassic Park, people are surprised that Lexi would know that Unix system. Why would a kid know how five or six digit cost Unix workstations operate? Well, maybe most kids won't, but most kids also don't have a rich ass grandpa with connections to genetic engineering work. Who knows what she might have been allowed to play with while visiting grandpa at an office or whatever. Not to mention there were some Unix OS in the home market at least in the early 80s, like Xenic. I'm just saying that while it wasn't common, it also wasn't impossible that a kid in the early 90s might have had some Unix experience. The line delivery aside, I don't see the problem. Also, I've seen some people assume it was a Hollywood Wii, but that was legitimately a file browser available on ski machines at the time. Hell, I bought myself in Sky and D ten years back just because the thought of owning a computer that used to cost a shit ton of cash amused me, and that file browser was on there. Also, Lexi expressly stated that she was a hacker while on the trek back to the Welcome Center with Alan and Tim. And since network servers at the time almost exclusively operated on Unix derivatives, Lexi would have to be familiar with the operating system for her stated skill set. This makes even more sense when you apply it to a real word parallel. Bill Gates as a kid had access to amazing technology because of his parents. This isn't a dumb story idea. Dark Knight Rises. How did Bruce Wayne magically get to Gotham after he escaped the hole? In an adjacent scene, it's mentioned the bomb will go off in a month, so we can assume that's how long he has to get back to Gotham. Wayne Enterprises has offices around the world. All he needs to do is get to an office, log in, and wire himself money or supplies to get home. He's Batman. He can easily do this without being noticed. Batman. He can easily do this without being noticed. Batman Begins has a whole sequence of him traveling around the world, penniless and nameless. This is a specific skill. It's already established he has. There are tons of plot holes in that movie, but for some reason people get hung up on the easiest one to explain. The bigger plot hole was Bruce Wayne healing a busted spine by popping a vertebrae into place and hanging from a rope for a bit in a dungeon. I ain't doggy, Owser, but that doesn't seem realistic. I never really thought much about that scene until I herniated a disc myself. It took me four months of light duty, physical therapy, steroids, muscle relaxers, traction, stretching, and peptidize to get better. That being said, I don't have Batman's willpower, so there's that. This always bothers me in movies, but especially in this one. 
when a character ties a rope around their waist for safety. Climbing harnesses don't go around your waist, they go around your hips. If you tie a rope around your waist and fall, you are putting your entire body weight on your stomach, crushing your internal organs. This is especially a bad idea for someone who is still healing from a broken back. That first failed attempt would have 100% rebroken his back if it didn't actually kill him. Also, they have a safety line. Why don't they use that to hoist up a ladder or something to make that jump? Better yet, just climb the rope. How is it so hard to escape from this pit? How is it so hard to escape from this pit? It was so hard to escape that the only ones to ever successfully do it were a child and a cripple. They didn't want to escape. It was actually pretty chill down there. They had game cubes and frozen yogurt. Bruce Wayne, having catches of equipment and money around the world, and knowing a way to get into Gotham without being seen, seems so obvious. It doesn't even need to be explained in the film. Such a ridiculous complaint. Ooh, I don't think Batman was prepared for either of these scenarios. He was. He's Batman. I'm very forgiving of Sirifi stuff, even if they are trying to be realistic. Batman tumbler and bike, the Batwing, the phone sonar, the USB drive that can wipe Catwoman's record, etc. I give all that stuff a pass. It's when the movie isn't consistent with its characters or story structure that I take issue with, like how Batman trained years to do what he does and doesn't want anyone else doing it. Until he just hands the keys to the Batcave to a rookie cop. If the bomb is dangerous... Why keep it under Gotham instead of away from the city or dismantled? A terrorist attack would void all transactions for the day, not drain Wayne's bank account. How are all the cops in the sewer not have their guns but do have shaving razors? How is Bane the new League of Shadows when he is out in the open recruiting homeless people? Even if the stocks were sold for pennies or just transferred to a new owner, the bank swoops in and starts foreclosing on his manor like the very next day. You're telling me he still has a mortgage on his multi-generation family manor. They shut down his power, again, like two days after the hack. They don't do that. On top of there being procedures and warnings that they have to follow give, they don't shut off power two days after a missed bill. That's a safety hazard. And above all else, they hack the stock market, so the most they could affect is the stocks that Bruce owns. You're telling me that freaking Batman, Mr. I'm prepared for any scenario, keeps all of his wealth tied up in stocks and has no backups to his stocks? That he doesn't keep a cool billion or so in a savings account for a rainy day? Jurassic Park, Hammond, cheaping out on hiring Nadri. Note, this does get explained in the book. I'm just talking about what was presented on screen. A lot of people vilify Hammond for sparing oodles of expense on hiring Dennis Nedry and the dominoes that fell as a result. If you listen to the dialogue, though, Nedry, you know anybody who can network eight connection machines and debug two million lines of code for what I bid for this job. What he bid. Hammond opened up the floor for contractors to bid, and Nedry was the one that set his own price. Hammond just accepted it. On paper, he was likely looking at someone that was more than competent, highly skilled, and came in with a low bid. Sounds somewhat reasonable. Did he spare expense? Sure. Does that fly in the face of his claims? Absolutely. But so did everything else. He was a flim man that cut corners and rushed deadlines everywhere, and that was absolutely his undoing. But Hammond didn't set out to purposefully underpay Nidri, which was Dennis's justification to undergo corporate espionage. He just said you're hired when Nedry set his own price. Yeah, people need to understand that a tragic flaw is not a plot hole. We spared no expense. My dude, those are Ford Explorers. You spared some expense. I know in the book they are Land Rovers, Ayuk, but I always thought that was pretty funny. Maybe you could answer my Batman question that I had talked about till now. How come the machine used to cause the crazy water pressurization in Begins doesn't affect the water-filled human body? been wondering since I saw it as a kid, and don't think I caught the explanation on repeated viewings. Thank you. How did Andy reattach the poster after he crawled into the tunnel? He didn't. The poster was only attached to the top, as evidenced by the scene where he is seen digging into the wall under the poster, then looking out when he hears someone coughing, then ducking back under it. The poster is clearly securely attached at the top, but freely securely attached at the top, but freely moving at the bottom, thus allowing Andy to lift it to fall back down whenever he needed. Worthless point ahead, he in the novella Andy would occasionally have cellmates. During those times he could not work on his tunnel. That is one reason why it took twenty years to dig through the passage. 
Also, a side character who was a temporary cellmate complained that Andy's cell at the end of the block was the coldest cell in all of Shawshank. He had come close to finishing the tunnel, evident by the cross breeze, only to have a new cellmate move in for an indeterminate amount of time. The real anxiety happens between the lines. This one irks me so much. And then, when people complain how the warden couldn't have thrown a little rock through it if it wasn't attached. It's a poster, heavy paper. A small rock with sufficient force could easily pierce it. Inertia and all. Tom Cruise is not the last samurai. Ken Watanabe is. Cruise is just the path character. It's not a white savior movie, but instead is a white colonialist learning about the value of native cultures and people. And Daniel Day. Lewis is not the last Mohican. His adoptive father is. Samurai is also plural as well, so could be extended to all the guys in that final battle that died. In Wreck, it Ralph Felix could not fix Venelope with his hammer, that's because he lives in a world of a video game. A lot of older video games had damaged state's values, for entities his hammer is not repairing the code, or resetting it to its default state, it is simply resetting the damage value of that object, back to zero he couldn't fix Venelope, because her damage is not damage, she is an entity took it is. Damage due to King Candy Turbo, intentionally sabotaging her code blocks, and most importantly removing the links that connects them to the overall network. This is why she is able to exist in Sugar Rush, but not leave with her code severed the way it was, and having those connections destroyed her. Entity data could not be passed to other devices. It's like she was isolated from an arcade, wide sort of internet, as their conscious technically exists, separate from their body, their conscious exists, within a block of code Felix can't fix that. Despite his mantra of I can fix it, he can't, he doesn't know how to manipulate the code, his hammer just resets damage values. And that's why he couldn't fix Vanilla. Also, I think I have a potential explanation to the whole idea of why majority of characters in that universe don't really seem concerned by the whole danger of dying outside of your game, but I'll save that for another thread, as that one's more of a theory. I would so love to read your wreck it Ralph theory. Jack and Rose couldn't both fit on the door in Titanic. In the movie, they tried to both get on the door, and it capsizes, because the door isn't buoyant enough with both of them on it. Jack then gets off the door, so Rose can get more of herself out of the water. It's in the movie. They try to do it in the movie, and it doesn't work. It doesn't matter how much surface area the door had. It's the buoyancy of the door that was the problem. Mythbusters did it, where they took the life jacket Rose had, and tied it to the weak corner of the door, giving it enough lift for both of them to survive. So all Jack and Rose needed to do was put their engineering degrees to good use, write out a plan, experiment with different ways of staying afloat, and they would be in just fine. James Cameron actually responded to that with his own experiment. He has two people play Jack and Rose and wear thermometers both internally and externally, and used a copy of the door from the movie. If they had both stayed on it, they would be in the water too much, and both would have died from hypothermia. Internally, you say? James Cameron, exploring the deepest depths known to man. And while we're at it, why didn't the Titanic just go around the iceberg? The movie's full of plot holes when you think about it. So is the boat, unfortunately. You can see Jack make the decision that he can't fit on it. You see him think for a second, then he nods his head and immediately starts to reassure Rose. I think he would figure out a way to make it work for both of them, but he decided to make sure Rose was safe. At that point, they had almost run around the entire ship for hours, were shot at and sank with a boat. By the time they get to that last bit, those were two profoundly exhausted people. I think Jack knew Rose would be oak, and that was good enough for him. He just didn't have any extra energy to try and save himself. Lord of the Rings, the Eagles. They are not a taxi service. They would be subject to the ring influence too. There are flying Nazgul that could intercept them. There is a big fucking spotlight eye that could shine on them the moment they approach the border of Mordor. Failing all that, an entire army of orc could wait at map. Do making any approach impossible. Edit. The eagles are sentient and sapient. They are not mindless beasts that just do whatever the rider wants. Edit too. I'm not a Tolkien expert. I'm not a Tolkien expert. I'm a dungeon master and have to smack down my players' crazy ideas all the time. Edit 3. They could be carried part of the way. Oh, with Saruman the White and his raven spies everywhere and the ability to target it blizzard and force the eagles to land in a army of Urukai. The eagles are demigods and more susceptible to the ring's power. It works in proximity too. 
Boromir fell under its influence. Gollum killed his brother, only just seeing it. Heck, the Council of Elrond almost came to blows being near it. Galadriel lost her shit for a good minute, just being offered it. Exactly. The key part of the mission to destroy the ring was stealthily sneaking it in. Flying a bunch of giant eagles to Mordor isn't subtle. There's a reason Elrond didn't send an army like the previous attempt to defeat Sauron. Then, when an army did arrive at the gates, they didn't have the ring. They were the diversion, stealthily and, more importantly, carried by someone who wouldn't get corrupted. That's really the difficult part here, and only hobbits are shown to be suitable. And even then, Frodo was ultimately corrupted by the ring. It's just he held out the longest. Maybe if Gandalf hadn't fallen and the Fellowship dissolved, he might have been fine and got there quickly. But ultimately, he is the only option they have, and it's not even a good option. Maybe if Gandalf hadn't fallen and the Fellowship dissolved, he might have been fine and got there quickly. I think the story makes it pretty clear that no one is capable of willingly destroying the One Ring hence. Gollum still has a part to play. Couldn't agree more. They aren't just the eagles either. They are the eagles of Manwe, the king of Arda, not a fucking uber. They only came for Gandalf because he saved Gwaihir, the king of the eagles, from a poison arrow. Unsurprisingly, a lot of things on Middle-earth owe favors to Gandalf, but also unsurprisingly carrying an evil ring into certain doom and possibly returning the greatest source of power to the evil entity on the planet isn't covered by those favors.